whispers of love. This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior. Good day. 
here tonight. Amen. Amen. I'm going to ask you to stand, and we're going to go directly into the Word of God. I'm going to ask you to turn to the book of James. If you've got your Bible, we're going to be looking at James chapter 1. We're going to pick up in verse 21. And James says, Wherefore lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness, and receive with meekness the engrafted word, which is able to save your souls. The engrafted word. It's a word that's ingrained in you. When, when, when you start to turn on that meekness that he's talking about, then that's a way that uh, meek actually is kind of like a bridle of a horse. And, and so it, it allows that word to kind of guide you and it ingrains itself in you. In verse 22, though, or, uh, yeah, in verse 22, he says, But be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is likened to a man holding his natural face in a glass. In other words, like in a mirror. And for he beholdeth himself and goeth his way and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. For, but whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty, talking again about the word, just a different way to describe it, and continueth therein and be not forgetful here, but a doer of the work. This man shall be blessed in his deed. It's a very interesting commentary from James. James says if we hear the word, but we don't do it, we're like somebody who looks in the mirror with their natural face. And we see what we see with our, in the mirror with our natural face. And then we set the mirror down and we go on and forget what we just saw. Amen? That's what he's saying. He's saying it's like looking at yourself and, and not doing anything about it. That's what the Word of God does. When you listen and you're a hearer of the Word, but not a doer, you know what is right, but you're not doing anything about it. And I, I, I'm going to do my best tonight to preach on this, and I, I'm going to entitle it Mirror, Mirror. And God just kept turning me back to the book of James. Now, I don't know about you if you... Look over the book of James. It's one that you can miss uh, pretty easily. Like I, I, my Bible's pretty decent print, and I mean, there's the beginning and there's the end, right? Just one page. You know, we, we're just talking about five chapters here in the book of James. It's not a very long book of the Bible, but uh, we do know that James. There's a few different James in the Bible, but most people believe that James, the author of this book, is actually the brother of Jesus, right? So remember, uh, James was. He, he, Jesus had a brother named James, and many people think that's kind of the consensus is that he is the one who wrote this book. And it's pretty crazy, right? Because, like, I was laughing when I was thinking about this because, you know, John wrote his gospel, and you know that John wrote his gospel. And then every time there's a mention of John, what does John say? The disciple whom Jesus loved, right? Like, I always think that's the greatest thing ever, and I don't blame, it up, uh, blame him at all. I'd probably do something similar. And then, but then you read James, and I'm like, man, surely James is like, yep. And I don't know if y'all know this, but Jesus was my brother. I mean, we, we got the same mom. We're very similar, you know. And, but James never says that, right? And it's kind of interesting. Like, if that was me, you better believe, Brother Ron. I, I'd be saying it every time. Every time I got to me, I'd say, and I'm the brother of Jesus. I don't know if you knew that or not. Like, like you would introduce yourself, right? Like, like even today, it's like, hi, this is, this is Wayne Poston, this blah, 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 this hit. Hi, I'm the brother of Jesus. Like, you would even need to know my name. Just know I'm the brother of Jesus. That's the most important thing for you to know. But James doesn't do that. And most of the time when James is actually talking about himself or his relationship with Jesus, he actually mentions that he's a servant of Jesus. And, I, you know, I think it's kind of interesting, right? And I think probably some of this is maybe like, I don't know, if your brother was God and he tries to claim to be God, you probably don't want to call him God, right? It's kind of a weird thing. And I, I know, uh, I don't know, Dad, if Kenneth ever claimed to be God or you ever claimed to be God. But, you know, I can just imagine that's probably, you know, it didn't really work out so well for Joseph. That's all I'm trying to say, right? I mean, you'll find yourself in a pit in a really big hurry, you know. And so anyway, like, it's just kind of this weird dynamic. But James, is, as an author, is kind of interesting because this, this book, rather, it's obvious, like, he doesn't really beat around the bush much. I mean, it's a short and to-the-point book. And many people think that this is actually one of the oldest books in the New Testament, right? And, and if it's not the, it's, it's one of the top two, I believe, oldest books of the New Testament. And James is just very to the point, almost to the point where you're kind of like, man, James, you're a little bit of a grump. I mean, to be a brother of Jesus, you're a little bit grumpy. But James is just trying to prove a point. He's trying to get a message across to the people. And if this is one of the oldest books of the New Testament, I think that this gives us one of the most clear and accurate, accurate projections of the Jewish believers of that day that were closest to the time of Jesus. 
And that, that's why it's really interesting because this is an ancient scripture. This is an ancient message that we're reading about here. But it's, it's pretty wild to me that an ancient scripture can have such an impact for a modern message today. Because he's literally saying, you can't just be a listener. You can't just be a hearer of the word. You must be a doer of the word. And it's pretty incredible that even as the oldest New Testament book, the book that is as close to Jesus as you can get, that even at this point, as close to Jesus as you can get, James is saying, listen, boys, you can't just hear the word of Jesus and not do it. Like, to me, I would think that if you're that close to Jesus, if you're just a, a generation or two removed even from Jesus, that you would probably be like, wow, Jesus was just here. He resurrected from the dead. Like, we can literally go see these people that saw him with our own eyes. And we can literally talk to them. I can only imagine, Pastor, I, it just blows my mind how anybody could not want to do what this man said to do, right? right? And so, so, so it's kind of an interesting, interesting bit, right, to know that James is telling people, even in this day and age, that you can't just be a listener. You've got you to be a doer. And so I think, you know, my dad has preached many times about how he really understood the nature of God when he became a parent. Now, you really understand God probably more so than ever when you become a parent. And now that I'm a, a dad, it's become apparent to me, uh -huh, the dad jokes are a thing, but anyway, it's become apparent to me that he's right, yeah. that, that you really do understand the true nature of God when you do become a father, when you do become a mother. And one of the things that drives me insane more than anything is when I tell my kids to do something and they don't do it, right? And all the mamas and dads can say hallelujah, amen to that, right? Because there's nothing more infuriating, right? I was talking to the mayor of Cottonwood before service tonight, and I was asking him if they had, you know, debates over in Cottonwood or presidential elections or how the political structure went over there. And the mayor told me it's more of a dictatorship over there. And he kind of, you know, runs everything over there. And that's kind of how I see the Poston household, to, to be honest. You know, I'm not saying dictatorship is for everything. It doesn't scale well, but at a small scale, it absolutely works great in the Poston household, right? And so when I say something, I mean it. And that's what you need to do, right? And, and, and the more and more I think about it, probably the more and more I realize how frustrated my mom and dad probably was at the same thing. And so now that I have a mic in my hand and a platform to say, I want to publicly apologize to my mom and dad. I'm sure there's many a times you asked me to do something, I did not do it. I probably did deserve those many, many spankings that I got. But I just can't help but think, that this is not the same illustration that James is using, and it's kind of a picture of the modern church. You know, I can just imagine at our church at East Rafford, I'm, I'm the uh, associate pastor there and youth pastor, and I can just imagine if my dad was to come up to me and say, Kevin, uh, I, I need you to take out the trash. I'm like, all right, okay. And immediately upon him telling me this, I go home, go to my office, I go sit down at my laptop, and I start Googling things about trash. I do all kinds of research about waste management. I look up the best trash bags that money can buy. I look up exactly how much uh, uh, square footage uh, we have in America of waste right now. I start looking up all the details of where modern waste management began. I start remembering some of these quotes that these great waste contributors from long years ago have provided to us today that impact and, and, and really help us along in our waste management today in 2023. Maybe I start looking into all kinds of different details about it. And I, I spend hours upon hours researching this, Brother Ron. And then I go back to the church and somehow maybe I meet my dad in the hallway. And before dad can even talk to me, maybe I'm just so excited to talk to him. And I tell him, Dad, you'll never believe. I, I went and I looked and I researched. And you'll never believe that modern waste management actually began back in the 1800s. And, and maybe you'll never believe that like today we have these diesel trucks that actually get 35 miles to a gallon. And they're the ones that go around. But in bigger cities, they got these other trucks that come and they're unmanned. They're like robotic. They just go around. It's amazing. It's crazy. Did you know that recycling is a sham and that everything just goes into the same pile? We're not saving whales. We're not saving turtles. We're not saving anything. It's just, it's just a big sham. No one knows what's going on in that. In that. It's just big marketing thing like you know all this and maybe I can give him some quotes and some inspiration and some other things and I'm sure my dad would just be standing there with one question on his mind the entire time did you take out the trash <laughs> welcome to the modern church of 2023 
Because I believe a lot of times when we're reading God's word, we get so infatuated with the little stories here. And I'm guilty as all get out, right? I get infatuated with the word of God. And I'll be like, man, this is amazing. Look at this perspective. Look at this perspective. This is poetry. This is wisdom literature. This is prophecy. This is a revelation. This is a gospel of Christ. And we look and we're, we're deciding this and we're doing that. We're memorizing scriptures. We're, we're quoting this. We're looking at it in this perspective. This translation, that translation. We're doing all these different things. But sometimes brother Todd I believe that God is just sitting on his throne in heaven and he's saying yeah that's great son that's great daughter but did you take out the trash did you do what I asked you to do you see I have given you this great platform I've given you this great word of God and I appreciate the fact that you want to learn it and you want to memorize it and you want to listen to it but at the end of the day I've called you to be more than a listener I've called you to be a doer of the word of God when I was at New River, I was getting into programming and computer science stuff. And, and so I was trying to decide what school I wanted to go to, what school I wanted to transfer into. It was either Radford University or Virginia Tech. And luckily for me, I had a, a great resource of, of friends at both, both schools. And the current job I was in, I got to go to Virginia Tech a lot and work on their printers and stuff like that. And so I would ask them a lot of times, like, hey, what, what program would be better for me? And so I, I went to Virginia Tech and I was talking to some of the members of their IT staff and, and, I, and I asked this one particular man and this man's advice really dictated my trajectory, dictated where I went. This man at Virginia Tech, he talked to me, he said, well, Kevin, let me tell you like this. If you were my son, I would tell you to go to Radford University. Now this blew me away because here's a man, I'm pretty sure, who graduated from Virginia Tech and is also employed by Virginia Tech. And, I, and so I was really shocked. And I said, well, why? I don't understand. And he says, well, just from my perspective, he said, either way you go, you'll be fine. But from my perspective, the students that graduate from Virginia Tech, there's great professors there. They're very knowledgeable. They're, they know their stuff. But the students that graduate from there, they are taught more theory than they are in applied science. They are taught how to program. They're taught the different specifics about computers. They're taught how you interact with people. Don't get me wrong, but it's all kind of theory-based. It's all theoretical. But what I have noticed from students at Radford University is it's more of an applied science. It's a more applied degree. And over there, they have classes where you actually have a client. They have classes where you're actually working with a real customer with a real problem. And so you have to go and you have to learn how to deal with people. You have to learn how to, how to make uh, cuts on things. You have to learn how, how to ship things fast. You have to learn this. Stuff. It's more applied science than it is a the theoretical thing. And I will tell you, I heard that and my mind was instantly made up that I didn't want just a theory-based education, but I wanted to have some practical uh, knowledge and some practical experience when I went out into the real world. I want to tell you that I'm afraid a lot of our churches today have become a theory-based institution where we come in and we got a lot of theory about the Word of God, where we say all the right things and, and we speak all the right things and we sing all the right songs and we do all the right promotions and, and we do all the right plays and we do all the right things, right? We, we look like a church in theory. We have all the right things in theory, but when you get down to the brass roots of things, when you get down to what is actually, actually happening in the church, are we a church that's actually on the move? Are we a church that's actually got an applied science behind what we say? Are we a church that just say it, says it, and, and, and we just go on home and live in that same way? And I want to tell you, in a Pentecostal church, it can be very easy to come and feel the emotions of the anointing of God and feel the power of God. But the scary thing is when you come and you feel that in here and you go back home and you just live the same life that you were living before you came to church. God wants us to be a doer. God wants us not to just be a church that is a theoretical based organization. God wants us to be an alive church, a moving church. He said, upon this rock, I'll build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I'm going to tell you that gates are not afraid of words. Gates are not afraid of our scripture. Gates are afraid of action. Gates are afraid of people saying, I will not be moved. Gates are afraid of people who will pray all night. Gates are afraid of people that know no bounds, that they will worship God in the good times and in the bad times. I want to tell you tonight, this is not a theoretical exercise. Revival is not for a theory-based curriculum. This is an applied science where even in the lowest of low, I need to be revived in my spirit that God will call me to another level. Amen? 
We need to be a doer again. Yeah. I don't want to just have a theory based religion. I want to tell you that the devil is not afraid of your theory. I, I will be as bold to say tonight that the devil ain't afraid of how much Bible you know. The devil ain't afraid of you if you know who God is because guess what? He also knows who God is. Uh, yeah, Understand the first one that identified who Jesus really was was a demon. They know the story. They know all the theory. They're not afraid of you knowing the theory, but they're afraid of you applying the theory. They're afraid of you becoming a doer of the theory. They're afraid of you applying what God has said to your life because it will change you. And I'm telling you that we have got to wake up today. Our churches have got to wake up and realize that we are much more than just a factory of theory. That we are much more than just delivering the word week after week after week. We can preach until we are blue in the face. But until we the church become the church of our community. Until we the church become the church of the lost. Until we the church start going out and witnessing and giving and loving and sharing. Then we are nothing else than just a theoretical based church. With no action behind it. And the devil ain't afraid of that. Ask the seven sons of Sceva. That was a theory based operation that they did. They had heard. They had heard about what could happen. And so they thought well let's just give it a shot. Let's give it a try. And so under the theory. What I say should just apply. But they did not have it ingrained inside of them. That's what James says. James says you've got to put away all this filthiness. You've got to put all that away and get the word of God ingrained in you to where it becomes who you are. And when that happens, the devil gets put on the run. But if it's just a theory, if it's just like, well, I'm going to do this because they did this and it's just the same recipe, then the devil can sniff that out faster than anything. And we find that's exactly what happened with the seven sons of Sceva because there was a man who was demon possessed. This. And the seven sons, they went to cast the demon out. And they said, we adjure you in the, in, in, in the name of the Christ whom Paul preacheth of. And what does the devil say? He says, I know who Jesus is. Yeah. I know who Paul is. Yeah. But I have no idea who you are. I want to tell you that just as I want God to know my name, you better believe that I want every demon in hell to know who Kevin Wayne Poston is tonight. I don't want them to think that I'm just some theoretical big mouth who gets behind a pulpit every once in a while and preaches his little heart out. That's not who I am. I want to be a saved, sanctified, filled with the Holy Ghost man of God that knows what the applicable presence of God is in my life. The devil doesn't care how many songs we sing if we don't sing them from our heart. The devil doesn't care how many sermons you project if you're not saying it from your heart. If that word's not ingrained in you, the devil knows all the same things that you know and even more so, I would argue. Amen. He knows the scriptures inside and out. It's one thing to know. It's another thing to do. I, I told you it's interesting that James is the one saying this because of how close he is to Jesus this time. Because for the longest time, I, Brother Todd, used to think, I could understand this. Maybe we are at a place where we're not doing what we should be doing just because of the length of time. Just, just so much time has passed since Jesus was here. And maybe, maybe we can just give ourselves an excuse that that's the reason that so many people don't do what Jesus says. And that's why I was kind of taken off guard the first time I read this because I'm like, man, this is in James. I mean, this is all the way back. And people still struggled with this. But then it's like God just said, no, 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 no. Just wait. It gets even better. Because if you go to Luke chapter 6, Jesus Christ himself is talking to people. And he says, why do you call me Lord, Lord, but you do not do the things that I ask you to do? Wait a minute. Wait, 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 wait a minute. You're telling me that people that saw Jesus Christ, flesh and bone, them very self, saw the miracles that Jesus did, saw everything that man did, heard the great wonders of God, heard that this man, the son of the living God, was present on this earth, was telling them to do stuff, and they still did not do it? Amen. So you know what that tells me? It's not a duration problem. It's not a time problem. That's not what this is. This is a Satan problem. This is an enemy's attack. One of the things this weekend, 
that I think God has really helped me, and I, I hope to share it across to you specifically tomorrow night, is the attack of the devil. I feel like, Brother Ron, if we can just get to the, if we can get an understanding of the devil's playbook, yeah. if we could ever see what the devil had in his playbook, I think that maybe we as a church could be prepared for it. And I want to tell you tonight that I believe one of the big plays in the devil's playbook is to drive a wedge in understanding that we are to be doers of what Jesus Christ says to do. I, I'm put it like this. I think that a lot of churches, and you've got to be careful because the devil's a sly fox. He's wise as a serpent. I believe that a lot of churches, in a good intended way, have, have made a, rightfully so, a big deal out of Jesus being our Messiah. I, I believe we, we, we preach that to the lost, that Jesus is your Savior. Yes. Jesus is going to save you. He's your Messiah. He, he, he loves you. He died on the cross for you. And so we have that story, right? We preach that message. The lost come up. They kneel at an altar. They pray the sinner's prayer. They thank God. They thank Jesus for being their Savior. And it's a wonderful thing. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that's bad. It's an amazing thing. Thank God that Jesus came and died on the cross for us to be our Savior. But then it's almost like that's the climax of the story, and that's it. And then Monday comes, and life comes, Brother Tom. And when life comes... We've got to start making decisions. And there is our Savior. I mean, he's just right there beside us. Ain't he, Brother John? I mean, he, he's right there with us. And it's just like Jesus is standing there like, oh, you need help with that? I can help you with that. Oh, oh you, you've got a decision to make. I'm right here. I'm right here. And I feel like the modern church today, now I'm not saying everybody, but I'm just saying, I feel like this is the wedge that the devil's tried to drive in in a sneaky way. That a lot of times we put so much emphasis on Jesus being our Savior. That when he tries to become our Lord, when he tries to help us with our daily decisions, we say, yeah, I appreciate what you did for me on the cross, Jesus. But I'll be honest with you, 2023 is a little bit different than your day and age, okay? Like, I appreciate you kind of trying to give me this advice. But but I, let's just say that you're my Savior, and, and I'll take it from here, okay? I feel like this is the way the church lives today. Where we accept him as our Savior, but we do not accept him as our Lord. We call him our Lord, but I don't think a lot of us even understand what the word Lord means. Lord means he's my master. Lord means what he says I do. Lord says I have no option. It's a dictatorship. It, it is, it, it's an obligation of mine that when the Lord speaks to me and says you do this, it doesn't mean I ask questions. It doesn't mean that I get around it and try to find another way. It means I submit to my Lord, right? He's my Lord. And I want to tell you tonight, until Jesus becomes your Lord, he cannot be your Savior. And I think that the devil has drove a wedge in this because he knows. He knows that there is an attractive gospel to preach. That if I can just tell people that Jesus is your Savior. And then when life comes, don't try to do it themselves. We don't have to talk about Jesus being the Lord. We don't have to talk about Jesus making decisions for us. We don't have to talk about a holy lifestyle. We don't have to talk about shunning sin. We don't have to talk about doing away with that. You just need to recognize Jesus as your Savior and go on your merry life. But I want to ask you if that's you tonight. How well is that working out for you? If Jesus is only your Savior and he's not your Lord, how well is that working out for you? Because that is not the plan of salvation. Jesus didn't just come down on a cross just to be your Savior. He's King of kings and he's Lord of lords. Very specifically, Paul says in Romans chapter 10, I believe it is, verse 9 if I'm not mistaken. He said, if you confess with your mouth, Jesus, Lord, Lord Jesus. It's very specific. He calls Lord. And you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. Then you'll be saved. Yeah. There's an acknowledgement that he is Lord. I like what Paul said in Philippians. He said that God had highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth. And every tongue shall confess that what? Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. I thank God tonight that Jesus is my Savior. But we can never forget.
He is also our Lord tonight. I know, I know for a fact tonight that if Jesus is not your Lord, that your life is in shambles. It's not because I'm a prophet. It's just because that's how life works. If God is not your Lord, if, if this word is not your map and not your God, I can guarantee you, you are a person most miserable tonight. And church, I believe that this is one of the biggest reasons that we have people that come into our churches week after week who are looking for a better life and expecting a better life and leaving and no one will say anything about it. But in the back of our minds, I think a lot of us are thinking, I thought life would be a lot better than this. It's, it's kind of the quiet and the secret thing in a lot of our churches. When we come in and we give prayer requests, and some of our prayer requests, they start turning into vent sessions, and I feel like we're listening to the book of Lamentations all over again. Sometimes I sit back, brother, and I just say, where is the joy of the Lord? Because I read about a man named Job who lost literally everything. And said, though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. I have esteemed the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. When you have that mentality, it is obvious that Jesus is not just your Savior. He's your Lord. I'll do whatever you say. And Jesus tells us this, right? Jesus says, the person that hears me and doesn't do what I ask them to do. Let me give you an illustration of what they're like. They're like someone who just builds their house on the sand. And when the storm comes, and I think we can all agree, we're all old enough in here tonight to know that if you live life long enough, the storms will find you. And when the storm comes, you have no foundation. And so that house will begin to shake, and ultimately that house will begin to fall. And you know what ends up happening? We think that we can do it ourselves. This is, this is humanism. This is the modern gospel today. That you are enough. That you can do it. That, 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 and this is why you go in Barnes & Noble or you look on Amazon. The bestsellers are always the most self-improvement books, right? How you can improve yourself. What you can do to reach your goals. What you can do to have success, right? And so we try to build ourselves up. And we promote ourselves by this. And we say, look at me. I built myself up. Until the next storm comes. And then there we find ourselves again, flat on our back. And this becomes a repetitious cycle, time after time after time. And the sad thing is that many of these people that are in this cycle come to our churches today. And God is saying, this is not the life that I have built for you. This is not the life that I have intended for my people to live. Because my word says that when you are free, you are free indeed. And that Jesus didn't come to just give you life, but give you life abundantly. I want to ask you tonight, is your life a life of abundance? Is your life a life where you would say, I thank God, my cup runneth over. If not, maybe we need to turn back to Jesus being our Lord. Because he said, when you do the things that I ask you to do, I'll tell you who you're like. You're like someone who builds his house. He digs deep and he finds rock. He gets a solid foundation and he builds his house upon that rock. And when the storm comes, the house stays solid. The house is standing firm. I thank God that sometimes it's hard. Sometimes I have to make a decision. Am I going to go Kevin's way or I'm going to go the Lord's way? And I will tell you that times I've went Kevin's way, that foundation has got really weak. And when the storm comes, I go kaplooey. But when I set my feet on the solid rock, when I say, God, not my will, but your will be done, I'm just digging that foundation even deeper, even stronger. And can I tell you that in my history of being in church, I've seen men and women that storms have come against their house and they have stood the test of time. I've seen women stand up and say, I just got diagnosed with cancer, but to God be the glory because I know I'm a winner either way. If he heals me or if he calls me home, I'm a winner either way way. It's an unshakable gospel. I'm telling you tonight, God is wanting you to be more than just a hearer of the word. You are to be a doer tonight. It makes you unshakable. When you become a doer, when he becomes your Lord. James has an interesting illustration. He says that people 
people that are a listener but not a doer. They're like someone who, who look in the mirror with their natural face. I like that, their natural face. In other words, a face that ain't got makeup on. Your natural face. It's like someone who looks in the mirror with their natural face and then just goes about and forgets what they saw. Now, I'm no prophet, but I would imagine that almost everybody in this room tonight, before you came to church at some point today, looked in a mirror. Right? Is it probably? There's always one. There's always one that says, not me, preacher. Not me. Yeah, we know. We know. We can tell. We can tell. And Harlan, I have a mirror for you. After church. I'm just kidding. But he says, <clears throat> I brought this from home. Amen. He says that a person that is a, a listener but not a doer is like someone who looks in the mirror. Man, I'm sweating a lot. Looks in the mirror. And then and they look at their natural face. Now, what is the point when you wake up in the morning of looking in the mirror? I don't think it is to see how great that beauty sleep was to your face. Like I just... <laughs> Some tells me that's probably not the reason, right? The reason that we look in the mirror is to assess the situation, right? I mean, let's just be honest. We are assess the situation. And for some of us, the situation is more dire than others, right? Be honest. But we assess the situation. We wake up, we're like, man, I've got sleepies under my eye. I must have drooled a lot last night. So all the way down my cheek. It's on my shirt, big grease. Look at my hair, I got cowlicks all over the place. Did I sleep in a blender last night? Like, what happened? And then if you're like me today, I was looking at my beard. I was looking at all these gray hairs sticking out. Like, man, I'm getting so gray. Thanks a lot, Tasha and the kids. You know? <laughs> and I decided before I came to church to trim my beard. Because I was like, man, these gray hairs. I don't know about y'all, this is a whole other side story. But my gray hairs are crazy. I mean, they come out of my face and they just go everywhere. I mean, everything else kind of tame. But you get a gray one, and that, that guy doesn't want to just go in line. I mean, it is it just stays where it wants to stay. And, and I'm, a, I'm a little concerned about this. And I, I don't know, maybe that's when they say, like, you go gray, you go stray. Like, I, I, feel, like, I feel like they're just kind of straying everywhere. I'm a little worried. I'm going to look like Albert Einstein one day with all these gray hairs. They're just everywhere. But, but that's why I'm, I guess I'm going to have to trim my beard real short all the time. But anyway, I'm just talking about you're assessing the situation. That's what you're doing, right, when you're looking in the mirror. And you're trying to figure out what you're going to have to do. Now, what's interesting about when you look in the mirror. Now, every single one of us in this room, we look in the mirror the same amount of time. Now, I'm not saying the same duration, like same minutes and seconds. But we all look in the mirror as long as it takes to fix the situation. And we'd all agree with that, right? And so we're looking and we're peering into this mirror. And, and what's interesting is James says that if, it, that if you're a doer and, 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 or you're a listener and not a doer, that it's like you take a look at your natural self, you set it down, and then you go on your merry way. And you never think about it. Can you imagine tonight if all y'all showed up with your natural face on? <laughs> right? Some of y'all women just now are like, oh. you just like you had chills. Like I would never, never, ever do that. Right? But that's what he's saying you're like. And, and you, you know, I think it's interesting, right, Brother Rock? Like, you could probably get away with it maybe tonight. Maybe you come in. And maybe you, I was like, man, Brother Rock had a rough Friday. I mean, yeah, good. <laughs> you know? You probably get away with it one night. You might even get away with it tomorrow night. You come back, it's like, whew, all right, okay. Yeah, something's going on. But you come Sunday morning and it's been three services in a row and you look like you you got a bird's nest up here and just nothing's happening right here. Like we're probably going to start asking some questions. We're a concerned church. We care for you. We love you. We're probably going to start asking some questions. Like, hey, everything all right? Are you sleeping out back? Like, are you still in your house? Do you still have a mirror in your house? About you? <laughs> right? We would ask this, right? Because it makes sense. Nobody that's sane would do that. I can't even imagine that. But that's exactly what, what James is saying the church is doing. That we are great at listening to the word. We're great at consuming the word. But we're not so great at doers of the word. 
And can you imagine what God sees with his spiritual eyes when he looks down at churches coming back week after week, seeing people listen to the word of God, looking into the mirror, peering into the word of God. That's not only a map, but it's a mirror for you to reflect who you really are. And you just keep coming back week after week and you keep looking in the same mirror, but never doing anything about it. That's what God sees. And I believe this weekend that God's trying to wake us up. That we are not to just keep peering in the same mirror and seeing the same filthiness and seeing the same dread and seeing the same situation. God has allowed you the opportunity to know what you need to fix. It's a mirror for a reason. And God says, all I want you to do is fix it. It's all you have to do. I think what's interesting, though, about a lot of our churches today is that we get obsessed with the mirror. Not with a reflection in the mirror, but we get obsessed with the type of mirror. Now, this is an old-fashioned mirror. It's a handheld. There's nothing crazy about it. Just an old mirror. Nothing crazy. And take it. Whatever. It's good. It's durable. It, it goes around with you. But somebody might come in and say, that mirror is junk. You know what you need? You need some power. You need a Pentecostal mirror, right? You need to plug that thing up and shine God's light in your face, right? <laughs> And then another, another guy comes up and says, that ain't no good. You need one of them mirrors that's got two sides to it. You ever seen them? You look in, it's like a magnifying glass. You really want to see some imperfections? You'll see all those blackheads you got on your skin. You'll see every dot and pimple you've got. I'm telling you, that's the mirror you need to get, right? And we analyze the mirror, and we talk about the mirror, and we look around the mirror. I saw it today on Facebook. Somebody was asking about a specific church. What, what, what do y'all think about this church? And, and there's the line of people commenting. I think when I looked at it, there was 80 some comments about the mirror. Well, I like that kind of mirror. I don't like that kind of mirror. That mirror's junk. That mirror's great. That mirror's been great to my family. That mirror's been terrible to my family. I don't like the music that that mirror plays. And I don't like the worship that that mirror has. I don't like the word of God that mirror has. Meanwhile, no one's talking about the reflection. All we are concerned about is the mirror. Brother Todd, I got to praying about this and I thought, how in the world have we gotten to a place in our churches where people can keep showing up to church knowing that they are seeing their reflection and not do anything about it? How is that possible? If I looked at my natural face every day and did nothing about it, I think I'd be a man most miserable. But yet that's who we are. And I want to tell you what God told me. He said, Kevin, unfortunately, a lot of people have taken the mirror out of the church. Because let me tell you what, if I'm a pastor and I want happy people, you know what I'm not going to do? I'm not going to show them a reflection of who they are according to God's word. I'm going to tell you stories. I'm going to keep you fat and sassy. I'm going to keep you happy. I'm going to keep you giving your tithes. I'm going to keep making sure you come in. I'm going to keep making sure you bring your kids. I will make them happy. We're going to include everybody. We're going to accept all things. We're going to be everything to everybody. But I want to tell you that my God has a mirror tonight and it's the perfect law of liberty and I will not water it down. I will not stop preaching it. We will not stop talking about it and we will not stop doing it will we church amen. 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 amen i want i want i want god's mirror to impact who i am in my life i want to tell you that ministry oftentimes is a result of moments in the mirror so many of the greatest ministries are a result of moments in the mirror i think about gideon who was a man who complained to the angel of the lord and said I thought you brought us out of slavery and now we're back in bondage. What, I, I, what, what good are you, God? I don't understand. And the angel of the Lord was nothing more than a mirror. And the angel said, did not I call you? Did not I send you? Just pointing it right back in the face of Gideon. Jonah had the mirror that showed up in the form of a whale, of a big fish. Showed up as a mirror to show him where he should be, right? David had a mirror come to him by the name of Nathan. David had gotten messed up. And before you knew it, right, he got to a situation where he had lusted of his flesh, where he had committed adultery, and then he had committed murder and didn't even realize it until Nathan comes along and points the mirror at his face and says, you're the man, David. It's you, David. Peter had a mirror one day, right? He, he was talking with Jesus and he said, God, or he said, Jesus, I'll never leave you. I will die with you. I will go wherever you go. Whatever they do, I will be with you always. And the alarm clock goes off. The, 
the, the rooster crows three times, and that was the mirror for Peter to realize I am not who I thought I was. I want to tell you tonight, that's exactly what the word of God will do to you. I told you before, we stay in front of the mirror as long as it takes to fix the situation. And some of you might already put two and two together and you say, well, buddy, you're a preacher. It sounds like you stay in that book quite often. You're exactly right. I do because I see the situation standing before you. And I know that I am the biggest sinner of them all. And I know that every time I look, God shows me something else I need to fix. And that's why I'm so captivated. It's not because I'm in vain. It's not because I can't quit looking at myself through this mirror. It's because I know that I need a savior. I know that I need work. I know that God is the only way that I'm Make it. Amen. 